this week, this week we continue on. So we've covered uh, ciphers, symmetric key, hashing, and Mac. And now we're going to look at a, a more difficult area, uh, and that's that's public key encryption. But it's fundamental to our studies to understand what public key encryption is and especially what the weaknesses are, what the strengths are, uh, and, and so on. Uh, so we'll do some, uh, we'll do some encrypt public encryption in the lab. What I'd like you to do is to send me your public key. So in the lab today, I'll get you to create your PGP or your GB, G, GP, P, GPG key. If you could send me it, uh, then uh, I'll be able to send a signed email uh, message and uh, hopefully you'll be able to, to decode it. So that, that's a task for today. So if you make sure that in the next few days that you, you, you at least send that, send it with the module number and with the name my public key is in the subject field, uh, I'll send you back a signed uh, email. Okay, so that's, that's where we are today. Uh, the focus is on uh, public key in encryption. And really what public key encryption is, is that we can create a special set of keys for Bob and Alice that work together. So it's called a trapdoor function and it was uh, Reves, Shamir and Alderman that came up with the first method. Uh, Whitfield Diffie proposed that it might be possible. Merkel did work unbelievably on his undergraduate dissertation, uh, his undergraduate coursework, and it was actually dismissed by his professor, saying confused. Uh, Merkel submitted a paper later, uh, and it was refused by the IEEE. He was proposing a public key method. He didn't the IEEE sent back saying that he didn't have any references. And the reason he didn't have any references was that it was completely and absolutely new. <laughs> there was nothing that he could take that was existing and refer to it. Uh, so sometimes genius can go by the way, sometimes and sometimes your professors might see, not see your genius. <laughs> So although we might give you bad feedback for your courseworks, then if you believe in something, then kind of go ahead and, and, and do it. And Ralph Merkel, Merkel trees, the basis of blockchain, <laughs> basis of a lot of systems just now, his work really has revolutionized uh, 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 computing. So what we want to do is to be able to use these two magical keys. We have a private key, that key is kept secret <laughs> and we have a public key that everyone can actually see and use and the good thing is that they can work together so we can encrypt with one and decrypt with the other and they work uh, that way as we'll find it's a pretty processor intensive task that we ask a compu computer to do especially dealing with very large numbers very large prime numbers and so on. So you're not going to encrypt your movies or you're not going to encrypt a lot of data with this. And so what we do is that we typically use this for two purposes, mainly. One is to sign something. So you ask me a question, what's the capital of Scotland? And I say Edinburgh. And I encrypt Edinburgh with my private key. Well, that's Alice's, with Alice's private key. And I send it back to you. And then, on the other side, to prove that it was me who actually sent back that challenge, you can see the public key. <laughs> so the public key is fundamental. And the public key has got to be distributable. And normally, what we do is that we stick it on a certificate and we get Alice's certificate and when we come back to this I've lost Alice's certificate just now but let's pretend oh here it's here 
we take our LSE certificate, and there it's there. So every single time you connect to Google or a website, you get one of these digital certificates. It's kind of verified that this is my true public key. So Trent Megacorp, in this case, is saying that this truly is Alice's uh, private key. As we'll see today, there are other formats. Uh, it's not just certificates that carry these things, uh, but I'll explain them in more detail. A lot of it's about how long this is valid, uh, who signed it, what it's trusted for. So this one's only trusted for web and email, and it shouldn't be trusted for anything else. So it's this key that we use to sign things, and increasingly it's the signature that's important. When I send you some cryptocurrency, as we'll find out, all that happens is that I take my private key from my wallet and I sign a transaction and I do put my public key onto the blockchain so that you can actually see what my public key uh, actually is. And you can check that the transaction, I don't have to send it to Alice, uh, it's on the blockchain and I've signed away my money with that, which means if somebody gets this, you're in trouble. <laughs> so if you're Google, and if you get Google's private key, then all of the communications that have been signed uh, could be breached. And it's happened quite a few times in industry. Uh, it's happened with Adobe quite often. There was a case in the Far East, uh, it was a hacker's hotel. And basically what happened when business people went to this hotel, there was a whole lot of hackers watching them that knew exactly all about them. They then sent them Adobe updates with 512-bit uh, RSA keys that looked as if they had been signed by Adobe. So they had cracked the keys. <laughs> they had cracked the key pair that was used to sign the Adobe updates and then they could modify the code however they wanted because they now could modify the Adobe updates to do whatever they wanted uh, with it. When the user checked against the Adobe signature, it was, it was fine. So if you lose your key, you can be in all sorts of troubles. The largest expense that any relatively large company will have in cybersecurity is the loss of these things. <laughs> to mitigate against that, to look at the damage, <laughs> you've got to call up all of the, your companies that, you're, that you work with. You've got to look at all of your systems. You cannot trust anything anymore because your private key has been stolen. Someone can fake the, the ID of the company. Somebody could sign things on their behalf and I think it costs something like 120 million average for the top companies in the world to mitigate against the serious breach of the trust uh, infrastructure. The other method that we use is in key exchange. With key exchange, I come up with a key that I want to use. So let's say I'm communicating with Google. So this is the unique key I now want to encrypt my communications with Google. If I take my private key and encrypt it and send it back to Google, which key does Google use? Uh, sorry, <laughs> I'll spin that around. Okay, uh, Google sends me their public key. Okay, so I, I'm connecting to Google let's say Amazon. So Amazon sends me their public key, it's on their certificate, when I connect to Amazon. And I decide that I want to use this key, an AES key, and I encrypt that with uh, Google's, with Amazon's public key, and send that back. Which key now will decrypt the key? Was it again? Amazon's private, Amazon's private key. So Amazon take the private key and it's open. So that's 
TLS 1.1, and that method has been kicked out the park completely. It doesn't exist in TLS 1.3, and is one of the reasons that you should upgrade to TLS 1.3 as soon as you can. We'll come back on to this when we look at tunnels, but can anybody tell me what the flaw is in that method? I'm not expecting you to answer it, but does anybody see a flaw there? So, if you see what I did, I created a key that I want to use for my S... S yeah. Not necessarily. The, the, the certificate has came in with uh, Amazon's uh, key. So the certificate that you receive has, has been signed by VeriSign. I can, can I trust the public key? That is a risk. If I fake, if I have a self-signed certificate, then I shouldn't be trusting this public key. But it's a good answer. <laughs> any, any, anyone else want to say what the weakness is of what I've just outlined? So it doesn't exist in TLS 1.3 anymore. <laughs> So why has that method been uh, deprecated? It's not even deprecated, it's gone. <laughs> it's gone. What's the, what do you think the weakness is of what we just did there? And what happens if somebody gets Google's private key? An insider in Google, a lot of insiders. What's going to happen? What was it? They've got your keys? Uh, they've got all of the keys. <laughs> Every single one. So if somebody's been... You, you do know that you are... All your packets are logged somewhere. <laughs> somewhere, especially in a corporate infrastructure, your packets will be recorded even though they're in a tunnel. Uh, if somebody can replay back all of your secret communications, they will then use... They could uh, decrypt the keys. So we'll look at what's called ephemeral keys and how we can make sure that a hack of one key doesn't lead to uh, the breach of, of the rest of them. So there's the, there's the methods that we have for public key. OK, so if we wanted, it's not really, it doesn't happen very much. But if, uh, if Alice wants to... Uh, send an encrypted file to Bob, then, uh, sorry. oh sorry, it's the other way around. If uh, Bob wants to send encrypted files to Alice, then, then she sends her public key. Bob then encrypts the data with that public key, and then it's Alice's private key which will decrypt it. It hardly ever happens. So it happens for small amounts of data, but even when we look at PGP, we'll see that that just doesn't happen. It's not possible to use RSA for encrypting your files and so on. Uh, it just isn't efficient in the competition. We'd, could we, what would we use? AES or ChaCha20 or, or a good cipher which is fast and so that's one method so that's possible but uh, we'll see later with PGP how we really get this to work. The second one is the more important one in that we provide proof of identity. So with this, with this, uh, just let me see, uh, Alice wants to prove that she's Alice to, to Bob. So let's forget about how trustworthy the public key is just now. We'll come back on to that. So Alice takes some data, so it might be a challenge. Tell me the capital city of Scotland. And then she'll encrypt that with a private key. She then sends that through. And then Bob checks by decrypting it with, the pub, with her public key and only she can have the right 
private key to go with that uh, public key. So in this way, she's validated her identity. The third method that we can use is key exchange. <laughs> okay, so as I said, it's in 1.2 and before, and it's not in 1.3. <laughs> okay, so I'll explain it, <laughs> but it's not the future. And I'll explain in later when we look at key exchange what the improved methods are. But basically what happens is that, uh, so let's say that's Google, sends Bob the public key on a certificate, and it's, everything's great. He generates the key that he would like. 256 AES is a good one. And then he encrypts that key with uh, Alice's public key. She returns that back and she pops her private key off. Okay, our certificate has both the public and the private key, the key pair. And she takes the private key off there and decrypts the key. And they're both happy now because they now have a tunnel. They have a shared key that they both use. And even though Eve is listening to the key exchange, why can't Eve derive the key? Was it? Yeah, she can't. So it's 256 bits, it's 2 to the power of 250. Yep. Did the bomb need to also prove his identity in these areas? That's, we'll come back on to that. Okay. On the internet with HTTPS, unfortunately, it's only one way authentication of the server to you. In Wi Fi, <coughs> you can have two way authentication that he needs to do the same and prove his identity usually through certificates and, and signing. So you're right, you can have one way. In fact, in some Wi-Fi, it's Bob that authenticates themselves to, to the Wi-Fi access point, and the Wi-Fi access point doesn't authenticate to him. So it can go either way, or it can be two-way. The best one is two-way, yeah. <laughs> Not peace, but two-way. <laughs> two-way or mutual authentication, mutual signing where they can both uh, authenticate each other. Okay, so try and cement that. Yeah. yeah, it's not easy to put a certificate. It's not easy to do a creep here. But in the future, your biometrics, so a lot of the stuff that goes on on the mobile phone uh, is proper signing. <laughs> so all your visa transactions, if you use Apple Pay, you have key pairs, things are properly signed. It's just the way that HTTPS was set up, it's not great, it's rubbish. SSL, TLS is pretty rubbish. Anyway, you don't know, you can create a, a man in the middle type thing, smart firewalls and uh, let's not go there just now. <laughs> so the way that we do this is to create a hard problem an NP complete, something that is really difficult to solve for a computer if it doesn't know the magic thing <laughs> that's the secret. And there are problems that are hard now, and there are problems that might not be so hard tomorrow. <laughs> so you can't ever guarantee that a hard problem will stay a hard problem, especially with quantum computers coming along, then to factorize prime numbers is not a difficult thing for a quantum computer. But what we do is we create a, a method that is difficult to solve. And the three main ones that we use for public key methods is to, they hate factorizing. <laughs> so if I take, I know it's not a good example, if I take two prime numbers and multiply them together, uh, computers aren't very good in finding out what were the two prime numbers that caused that one. Uh, remember, we deal with 2,048 bits or 4,000 bits. These are massive numbers. Uh, there are trillions and trillions of possible outcomes. Uh, so they find that one quite difficult. So that's the method that RSA is, uses uh, RSA still exists in certificates, 
and it's still around. Does anybody know what the state of the art and the size of the keys that we, if you've got the best RSA certificate, what would a fantastic certificate look like? So we'll share one uh, with, uh, with the older keys. 512 is cracked for RSA and you've got to worry in that the original, uh, the original export license, does anybody know who created SSL? Which company created SSL all those years ago? <laughs> Probably before you were born. Who is it? You. Who is it? Was it? Yeah, there you go. So you should be okay then. It was Netscape. And Netscape came up with, with these methods for signing and so on. Uh, unfortunately, the US government, or the export, says, and it's happened in Australia just now, uh, that this is munition grade. This is equivalent to nuclear weapons for the risk to the country. So Netscape were limited to 512-bit RSA keys. And we've suffered ever since from that because uh, uh, an attack is to do a downgrade attack. <laughs> you take the, the weakest crypto that's possible <laughs> and negotiate. And if somebody can take the crypto down to 512-bit RSA keys, then they can discover the private key of the organization. And it happened, Logjam, Beast, all these things were downgrade attacks caused by the poor setup of, uh, of RSA. So RSA is still around uh, and it's, it's used in certificates now, but more and more companies like Cloudflare and so on are using elliptic curve uh, uh, certificates. Then we get what's called the discrete logarithms. And because we're in Napier's uh, uh, institution, then it relies on the difficulty of factorizing uh, a, a log problem. So the difficulty is it's almost impossible, given uh, 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 the cost, <laughs> typically measured in dollars or energy, to find out the value of x uh, given a g value and given a prime number and given y, you cannot find that within any reasonable time. That's the core of what we see on, uh, with, with Bitcoin and, and so on. And a lot of the ways to hide data is based on this discrete logarithm problem. And then the last one is uh, elliptic curve. And elliptic curve is just taking over the world. Just now, ECC, it's an IoT, it's in Bitcoin, it's in Ethereum, it's in Tor, it's everywhere. It's, as this has went to 4K, crazy amounts of... Uh, an IoT device, your mobile phone is going to struggle to do RSA 4K, but elliptic curve, we have much smaller key sizes. 160 bits is the equivalent of not quite that, but you kind of start around 160 bits with your keys, where RSA is now at uh, 4K. And the funny thing was, I can't remember what it was, but when Ron Rivest, Ron Rivest had a challenge in Scientific American, uh, Martin Gardner was the editor at the time. I'll send you the, 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 the actual article. But when, he, when Martin, Martin posted uh, uh, a challenge to the readers of Scientific American to, to, to crack, to factorize, and uh, at the time, Martin Gardner said, because of the size of the numbers, it would take trillions and trillions of years to crack your pocket calculator. <laughs> your, your phone at least could probably crack the sizes of the numbers. So although you might think something will take trillions and trillions of years, after a few years, you might find that 
the computing infrastructure has changed <coughs> completely. So those are the three core methods that we actually uh, use. And the way that we measure our security is dollars. <laughs> okay, the dollar is how much will it cost you to crack my password? And that dollar can relate to energy. So with the energy, you, you can calculate how much energy it will cost you to crack that, uh, crack that, that key. Because dollar really relates to the amount of energy that you're going to consume. So if you run on a GPU infrastructure, that's the amount of electricity that it will actually cost you to run it. So when you hire a GPU from Amazon, say, you're paying for the ele electricity. You're paying for, the, for buying the servers and so on, but mainly you're paying for the electricity bill to allow you to run the GPU. So this shows roughly how much it would cost you to crack a 35-bit a AES key takes the amount of energy it, it takes to, to boil a teaspoon of water. So you could probably afford that. What's that going to be? Less than a penny or something like that. So to crack a 35-bit key is only going to take you a teaspoon of, of uh, energy. To crack a 70-bit hash, it's a, that's a teaspoon. And to crack a 242-bit RSA key, it's a teaspoon. But then if we keep going up, and remember I told you that 72 bits was kind of where, where it kind of started. There were here. To crack a 72-bit key needs the amount of energy that would boil a pool. So if you think of your swimming pool, and you got heaters in there, and you had to boil that. How much do you think that would cost? Hundreds, maybe a thousands of energy. And that's only one instance. If we go up to 90 bit, you need the amount of energy to boil a lake or a loch. So you can imagine taking uh, 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 a famous loch, uh, Loch Ness. Imagine the energy that it would take to boil that. Uh, it's a cold loch. <laughs> it's going to take you that amount of energy to crack a 90-bit uh, 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 AES uh, key. And then if we keep going up, so there's 114 bits. This is the size of the, it's all of the oceans in the world and on a global uh, basis. So you can see here that as we go up, it becomes more and more uh, difficult to actually, uh, more and more energy to actually crack these keys. So let's look at public key encryption. So with public key encryption, we take two prime numbers and we multiply them together to give a modulus or an N number. The N number is available to anybody. So when I publish my encryption key, I'll tell you it's E comma N. My decryption key then becomes D comma N. So I'm telling you what the value is that I've used. The difficulty is <coughs> that you're not going to have enough money to be able to factorize n back into the two prime numbers that have actually been used. But unfortunately, computing power has increased over the years, and it becomes more and more difficult, and people find more and more prime numbers. And sometimes sysadmins use the same prime numbers <laughs> as the default. Uh, so it happened in, uh, was it Logjam? Yeah, Logjam administrators use, this, use the default prime numbers. Uh, 
So they were using a value that was already known uh, to be cracked. Even just the hint of knowing one of the prime numbers is enough to be able to factorize that, that back uh, from, from there. It was created by these three guys, uh, Rivest, uh, Shamir, and Alderman in 1977. And we're still using it, so it's done well to survive all those, uh, all those years. And they came up with a method that allowed us to be able to create this trapdoor or this, uh, this encryption method. Right then, so you probably won't get this straight away. <laughs> But I'll go over it, but I'd like you to go over it again and again and again until you get it, and then you'll lose it, and then you'll get it back again. <laughs> so I promise you'll get there eventually and understand what it's all doing with this, and we'll keep it really simple with very simple numbers to explain it. But the numbers we normally use are ginormous numbers. So we take two prime numbers, P and Q. We then multiply them together to get P times Q. That gives us our value of N. So let's say we take, in this case, 3 and 11, they're two prime numbers, and we get an N value of 33. We then calculate, if you're interested, I can show you why this all works, but we create a phi value, which is P minus 1 times Q minus 1. And in this case, that will be 10 times 2, which is 20. Right then, so listen to this. <laughs> this is what trips most up. We now pick an E value, our encryption key. And E just has not to share a factor with phi. It shouldn't have a, we call it, having the GCD of 1, but there should be no factors which E and phi share. That's the only thing. So what are the factors of 20? 2, 4, 5, and then multiples of, of, of that. In fact, we can even take two away. So we pick a number that isn't one of them. So if we pick 3 then our encryption key becomes 333. And that's it. <laughs> and it's that, it's that, just that little step there that trips most students up, that we have to pick something. <laughs> it just doesn't magic. What else could you pick? Seven, Seven works. Nine? Nine works. Eleven? Thirteen? Fifteen? Fifteen? No, because it's five. It's in there. Okay, so we just need to make sure. <laughs> then we need to then multiply, we need to find a value. When we multiply that value by the E and we take the mod, we end up with one. We can go through D if we want until we find 1, 2, 3, 7 times 3 mod 20 equals 1. So we've found the decryption key. Luckily, we don't have to do that kind of searching unless it's really simple numbers. And we can use a, a, a script to do the in, what's called the inverse mod. And we'll do that in the lab uh, today. So our encryption key is this. And our decryption key is that. So what we do is that we raise, and it's an exponential cipher, we take the message and we raise it to the power of E. And then we take the mod of N, as we've done before. So in this case, our message is 5. 5 to the power of 3, mod 33, gives us 26. That's the cipher. We now take the cipher and raise it to the power of D, and take mod N, and magically, it comes back with 5 again. The great thing here is this mod P. So you find a lot 
of systems use this mod p. It means that we can still do all our mathematics and it all works. And that's the reason that we use this mod p at the end. So that's the, that's the basics of it. And you really need to, to look carefully at some examples. So here's, here's an example here. It's going to work. There we go. So we'll work through this example, calculating, and then hopefully in the end, we'll end up, if we take our message, if we do all the maths, we end up with the same uh, value here. So I've got examples that you can try uh, and work through from, from that. Okay, so that's the basics. We'd be asking you for, to be able to at least understand uh, the operations that go on there. Uh, it will go in eventually, but you need to work uh, through it. The second method, and the method that's taken off increasingly, is an is elliptic curve. An elliptic curve looks a little bit like that. Okay, if we plot it. We uh, won't go into the maths of this, but it looks a bit like that. Okay, that produces that type of, of, of curve like that. And what happens is that the good thing about it is that if we pick a point, we typically call that G, on our elliptic curve. And then if we draw a line, so we'll make the line a different color. If we draw a line, from there, it will always cut at a point sometime in the future. It'll keep going on and on and on, and then if we keep drawing the line, it will, it will cut it uh, eventually. So that's the specialness about a elliptic curve, is that if we, if, we, if we draw it, we can actually find another point. And the way it works is that we take a point G here, remember that's like an X, Y point. <laughs> and then we pick a private key, which is N, and N becomes that gradient, and we multiply it, and we get P. And now, with P and G, you can't find out what that value of N actually is. It just isn't computationally possible. If you can do it, you will open up every Bitcoin wallet in the world. You will open up the whole of the blockchain. Uh, it's just not possible if we use a large uh, value of N. And N is typically 256 bits, which is a, a big key. You're not going to find that through brute force from there. Okay, so we'll find that our keys in the elliptic curve are x, y, x, y points. So if I tell you my public key, I tell you my x, y point. I also tell you that point, and that's it. <laughs> and that is the basics, the basis of what we'll see as signing. It's impossible for you to find out what that secret is. So it's used in Bitcoin, IoT, Tor, you name it. It's elliptic curve that's actually in, in there. Uh, so we'll come back on to this, but this is, this is how Bitcoin works. Basically, I pick a random number. We agree on that point there. I pick a random number. And that random number becomes a gradient. I then create our x, y point, which becomes my public key, this one here. So using this elliptic curve DSA method, I take that, that value, that 256-bit value, and then I can automatically create the public key from there. It then gets hashed, it's made into the address, so this is your Bitcoin address uh, here. So that relates to your public key there. 
but it's impossible for you to go back. Uh, many people <laughs> have asked. So I get requests by people saying, can you get the private key from the public key? And the answer is no. <laughs> Unless you have all the money in the world and you can boil all the planets in the world, you're not going to be able to reverse back to that. But when quantum computers come along, that's going to be easy or easy-ish. So that's the way that, we, that, uh, that we, it works for, for that. So we'll come back on to this, but this is the way that a Bitcoin transaction works. Basically, you create your wallet. Your wallet has a random seed, which is a private key, 250. That's all you've got. In your, I know it's disappointing. You think there's going to be lots of coins in your wallet. They don't exist. <laughs> you have a private key and a public key. So when Bob is creating a transaction for, uh, uh, when Alice, when Bob is creating a transaction for Alice, then Bob says, pay Alice 10 bitcoins. He then takes Alice's public address and puts it into the transaction. So it's then signed by his private key, this elliptic curve key. And he pops the public key onto the blockchain and everyone can check that Bob has just paid Alice that number of, uh, of, of bitcoins. So we'll come back on to this and look at it in more detail when we look at the blockchain uh, part. So what does an elliptic curve key actually look like? Uh, well, in this case, we generate our key pair. So we can use OpenSSL to generate that. And we're creating a PEM file. The PEM file has the keys in it. This can be quite a lengthy process because the machine has to randomize something. Do you know what are typical randomization things? that you're challenged with, when you create a new key, what might your key generator get you to do? Hover on the keyboard, type some characters, do something kind of human uh, for a while. Luckily, with operating systems now, the randomization methods dive into the operating system and they'll look for randomization of what goes on. But it's not never perfect. But hopefully, at the end of this, you've created a key pair, public key and a private key, and, and you should never release those. So the private key looks like, looks like that, and it has both the public key and the private key actually on it. So there's the, there's the private key in there. There's the parameters that we're using uh, for our elliptic curve. So that's the G value and the prime number are in there. So when somebody's reading this, they know what, what we've actually used uh, for our elliptic curve. If you want to look at it in more detail, again, we can use OpenSSL. And we can see here that I've created a 256-bit private key. And then I've created a public key, which is twice as long, plus another byte. So this is our x, y point on the curve. So that's why it's 512 uh, bytes, bits long, uh, because it's an x, y point. This is the value of n. Uh, this here identifies just a little identifier of the type of uh, point that it actually is. And then at the bottom, it tells us the curve that we're actually using. <laughs> so there are many different curves that are possible. This one is typically used in, uh, I think it's used in, in Tor networks and so on. There are other curves that were pushed as international standards and that have been shown that are hacked. So there are some people who promoted certain curves uh, as a standard and those ones should be avoided because it's well known that they are they are cracked this one here 
is a well-trusted uh, curve. Okay, so that's, that's our basic parameters that we have in there. That's our keys. We can have a wee look at what the, the basic uh, elliptic curve details are. So there they're there. Uh, there's the prime number that we're using. Uh, before, there's the generator point. Uh, and the A is if we have uh, we have A, then we have a zero value here, and then that's plus seven. So this here tells us the type of curve that we actually have. Okay, so as we find out, uh, it's used in what's called elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman. We'll look in more detail at this uh, next week. But elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman allows Bob to negotiate, and this is the Tor network, with each of the Tor nodes uh, and to negotiate a key uh, with them. Each of the nodes in Tor encrypts with their own symmetric key. And then as we pass through each node, they will decrypt with the key. So the first key that comes off is this one. The second key is that one. And then the third key is this one here. So this is the onion effect that we have. But elliptic curve is used to do the key negotiation and not the actual encryption that we use. OK. So as a final method to cover, uh, we all can also have El Camo, and El Camo uh, takes, makes it difficult for us to discover the value of x uh, if we know g, y, and, and p. Uh, we only certain values of g will actually work when we do this, and it's typically a value of 2 or 3 that, that we actually use. Okay, so they, today in the lab, what we'll do is we'll look at uh, PGP encryption. And the problem that we have is the email is almost completely untrusted. So you can't trust any email that you get. It's non-signed. Uh, you have no idea if somebody's looked at your email uh, uh, as, as it's in transit or if it's on uh, the system. The way that PGP works and this is the proper way to actually send a signed email, is that, is that Bob will take a hash of the message. So he's just saying hello. And with his private key, he encrypts the hash. He then takes uh, this, the message and uh, the hash value and he will create a unique symmetric key that he'll use. So this will be unique for every email that's sent and encrypts the message and the hash together. He then takes Alice's uh, public key and encrypts the key that he's used for the email with her public key. When she receives it, when she receives it, she then takes this part and decrypts it with her uh, private key. That then gives her the key that Bob has used to encrypt the email and the hash in there. So she ends up with that. She then decrypts it with that key and she ends up with the message. After that, she does a hash of that to check what the hash is. She takes Bob's hashed value here, uh, encrypted hash value. She uses his public key to decrypt that and ends up with a hash here. If these, these tie up, what has Alice proven? Yeah. 
So she's proven that the, that the context of the message hasn't changed, and she's also proven that Bob was the sender of the email, and only Alice, can Bob open up the email? So if he gets onto Alice's server, can he, can he read the email contents and change them? No. So he's only Alice can now read them. So we authenticate Bob as the signer, we authenticate Alice as the recipient, and we authenticate the message and integrity of the message because of this. So today, we'll set up your PGP email. Uh, if you want, you set up your own GitHub. Uh, I don't know if you have a GitHub already, but you can sign things in. You sign in to your, to your, uh, to your uh, SSH and your GitHub with your keys. Does anybody use that just now to use? Yeah. So it's a standard way that an industry, <laughs> it's one of the biggest risks. Your whole Amazon cloud infrastructure is dependent upon your key pair <laughs> that you actually uh, use. So OpenSSL will generate a key pair that exists on your machine. And also GitHub, when you, when you post to GitHub, it, you will log in with your, with your keys and sign the, 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 the code. So we'll look at that as part of the lab uh, today. So we'll have a break for a little minute and then I'll try and give you a little demo of a few things. I appreciate it's, it's heavy material and it, you really need to go away and kind of study and, and uh, digest it. Okay, so we'll have a break for about five minutes and then we'll start again. So, so I, I'll give you a few demos now. I don't know if that, if that helps. Uh, I'd, at all. Right, so, so in the lab today we'll do the practical side. So what we want to be able to do is to be able to generate a, a key pair and if you can create your own GitHub uh, and then sign in with your key pair. If you can uh, create your own uh, uh, GPG uh, uh, e email uh, key pair and we should be able to send uh, those signed uh, emails. So the lab today uh, looks a bit like this. So that's what a, what a, a, a PGP or a GPG uh, email looks like. So uh, you'll find that, that trusted message boards, you'll see the developer's keys there. Their PGP uh, uh, keys will actually define uh, their messages and, and their updates. So it's a base64 format. We always start with the begin and the end block there. And there's a little version that goes in, in, in there. So this is called an ASCII armored message. So that's the format that you transfer your, your keys and your encrypted content over a text channel. So if you're putting a digital certificate uh, or keys onto, say, a Cisco router, you would typically open up a terminal and you would copy and paste the keys into there. There isn't really a way, well, it's, it's not so much a way that you, you upload a binary file or anything like that. You typically copy and paste. So when I send you my keys, I'll send you it as, as this type of message. You then put that into what's called a keyring. <laughs> so the keyring, and this is where the problem comes in, the reason that we're not using encrypted and signed emails is because that keyring is so difficult to maintain. <laughs> uh, ask any company, this is what they would like. <laughs> they would like encrypted emails so that an insider who's running your Outlook Exchange can't look at all your messages and cause a large-scale data breach. So what they would like is to have signed messages 
and also encrypted end-to-end -end messages. But it doesn't happen as we see. You can use systems around the world and you can run your own. Uh, but what you get is your own key pair on, on your key ring. So that's the only private key that you have. So when you look at your keys, you'll see a private key and a public key. Just watch what you're doing and don't export the wrong one, okay? <laughs> don't, don't send the world your private key. It has happened many times. People have posted their keys, both keys, on the internet and been extremely embarrassed. Some senior people, uh, I could give you examples, you could probably search for them, of people, po people naively posting their public and their private key onto the internet and having to revoke. If you've ever get involved with the revocation process of keys, you'll know it's a disaster area. It just doesn't happen. So I've now decided my, my private key has been hacked. I now have to tell the world that you should not trust anything that I signed recently. It's kind of working a bit with Chrome. Firefox have got their act together. You can revoke certificates quickly and keys fairly quickly, but it often doesn't work. So, so what's that? Don't post your public, your public and your private key at the same time. So that's what it looks like. And if we look at, uh, oh, the recording stopped. Uh, just let's see what's happened there. Has that stopped my quick time? Start this again. Okay, so that uh, that's the key there. So you can have a look to see what the what the keys look like. Um, if I could quickly get my browser here. So what I'm going to do is I've got just a little bit of JavaScript that takes a key. So we'll take this key. I don't know whose key that is. Uh, but in the lab, we'll ask you to find a few public keys. So I'm going to paste that into there. And everything should be fine. And then we'll find out whose key this really is. And this key is, oh, dull. <laughs> it's mine. And you see, when we look at it, it's got my ID. So that's the, n the friendly name that I find my keys and I'll find your keys. So when I send you an email, it's the friendly name user ID that I would use. So it's typically this name here. When I send you an email, I look at your ID on my key ring. So the way that works is that you send me your uh, public key. I add it onto my key ring. And then when I'm sending you an email, I'll use your friendly name. I don't have to remember the hex ID. Uh, there's the hex ID there. It'll show it in my key ring, but it, 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 uh, I only have to remember your name, which is a problem because it, there might be more than one person with that, so it records my email address. Okay, So your keys are identified with a name and uh, an email address. So when you create your public your keys today, it'll ask you for your name and your public key, and that will be posted on to some system that will prove that. So typically that's into GitHub. So when we look at uh, GitHub, when we log into GitHub, we should find that uh, it all just logs in because our keys are set. So it takes my uh, public key, it's just a bit slow here. <laughs> it takes my public key, it takes my, my my public key and you put that onto GitHub so that when I log in, it will actually, uh, I can sign something with my private key. So if I use SSH or if I log into GitHub, I must prove myself as the user. So it's your key pair. So the risk, and I, I underline this many times, 
the risk is that somebody gets on your machine, your Linux machine or your Mac machine, and finds the place where your, op your SSH keys are, you're kind of stuffed because they can now log into GitHub and they can log into your possibly your cloud uh, infrastructure. So it's in here that you would actually define your uh, keys. Let's try to remember where they are. Uh, uh, there's a place that you can add your keys into that hopefully you'll be able to get, uh, uh, get, get set up. So once you've set up your repository, then you can actually sign code in to the repository. So not just post it, but sign all of your code updates and your document updates and your script updates. It comes up to say, so you'll find that some of my code isn't, isn't signed. Uh, from there, uh, take an example from the module. Uh, we'll find this one as an example, this one. Uh, so you should see that there's no signing going on. If you look at the code, it's not, it's not signed by anyone. So you can make sure that that signing happens by setting up the keys on your, on, your, uh, on your host so that when you upload code, you push code onto your repository, then it will come up to say that this person uh, signed it. It might not seem important to you just now, but I can assure you that the whole world has been run through GitHub's and SSH uh, connections. Your keys are fundamental to the security of your organization and the credibility of everything. So your documents, your configuration, your Cisco configuration, the whole of your infrastructure can be run through GitHub and can be rebuilt uh, whenever and you can roll back. So if you muck up a config, your GitHub allows you to roll back and take a different version or fork <coughs> your, your code. Uh, so it's a, it's a fun, fundamental thing. You can see here, uh, so I've used RSA uh, keys here. Uh, you can usually tell the size of your keys, how big they are. I think 2048 is the standard size of the keys that you would look for for RSA. 1000 is on the cusp of serious law enforcement being able to crack those keys. So you want to be 2,000, and if you're, you're really hyper secure, then go to 4,000. Uh, and if you really want, you can go for elliptic curve for your uh, SSH uh, keys. So that's, that's, uh, that's the first thing that we'll have to do, is to look uh, for that. If you could find the, the public keys of three famous people, uh, maybe Bruce Snyder or someone like that, and have a look to see if you can take their armor key <coughs> and, and interpret it uh, for that. So then we'll get you to uh, look at, uh, at some, some real keys. That's what uh, uh, our private key looks like. There's a cipher message. And we take Bob's public key, which is this one. And we've uh, public key, which is the private key, which is this one and uh, we'll create a message based on that uh, to be able to decrypt it. So as I said, we use OpenSSL to, to for our generation of our, our keys if we need to. So we'll look at RSA first, and then we'll look at elliptic curve. So how you create your elliptic curve uh, keys. And then if you're interested, we'll have a look to see how that's done in, in, in Python from there. If you can, try and get on to this part of the lab, which is for you to create your own PGP key pair. If possible, we want you to be able to send yourself in pairs <coughs> an encrypted email. For that, you'll have to generate your public and private key, send the other person your public key, they put the public key onto their key ring, and then once that happens, they can send you an encrypted email you use your private key to decrypt. So we use GPG 
which is installed, I think, on our, our uh, Ubuntu instance. Uh, it should be there. And we'll use command line. Okay, there's nothing wrong with command line. <laughs> Don't run a, a GUI for this. Try to understand the basics of what's going on. Basically, your GUI is just a fancy front end to this anyway. <laughs> You're not using anything. GPG works uh, very well. So with that, we should be able to create our key pair. So there's our key pair there. And then we export our, our public and a private key. You send your private key out. You'll put it onto a key ring. And then you'll list the keys that you actually have to make sure that you have their public key on your key ring. After that, you're then going to send them an encrypted email. Send it over. And then you should be able to use the minus D to decrypt this ASCII armored uh, file format and get the message back. If you're very lucky, you can use my public key. <laughs> okay, hopefully I've not exported both keys to there. It doesn't matter because I don't use these keys. So I've posted my key uh, there if you want it. So you can send me an encrypted email message and then hopefully if I find time, I'll send you a reply back again, okay? So it's a little challenge for you. <laughs> uh, please try and do it because it's, it's pretty fundamental what we're actually uh, doing here. It's the signing process, it's the encrypted email and it's making sure that only the recipient can actually read the email back again. So all the things that we like with public key are in here. And it's the way the email should have been uh, created. Does anybody have any questions about that and the, and the importance of it? I, I can't underline enough the importance of your SSH keys. <laughs> if somebody gets them, you are in big, big trouble because your login to your Amazon or your Azure cloud is done with those magic keys. <laughs> Somebody gets them, that's the one thing that they want. They take them off and they can now log into your whole Amazon infrastructure fr from there. So today we'll hopefully create your, your, your open SSH keys and hopefully you'll be able to create your own, uh, your own Git, GitHub repository uh, and put all your notes on there. So that's, uh, that's what we're doing in, in the lab today. So you should be able to get that done. And then we'll look at ThruCrypt. So the only show in town is the, is the Microsoft BitLocker. So uh, you can encrypt one or two files or you can encrypt a folder, it doesn't really work that well. The only way if you're working in a corporate environment is to encrypt the whole laptop. <laughs> when you encrypt the whole laptop, then all of your system files are encrypted. <laughs> so anything that goes wrong with that means that you can't boot up and you will never recover the keys or you'll never recover anything that's on your laptop, which is quite good if you leave the laptop uh, on the back seat of a taxi that nobody will be able to get in. So if you're working in a, in a secure environment, always make sure that laptops are full disk encryption. Does anybody know how you get around that problem in a corporate environment? So the worry is that if I, if I work for a bank and I encrypt the whole laptop and there's a, I lose the keys, does anybody know does anybody know in a corporate give environment? Give the laptop off and you go to the Yeah, give them a bit of paper, yeah. Or just leave it in a cloud backup. A yeah, cloud backup, yeah. So if they run an Active Directory, your company keeps a copy of the keys, <laughs> which is a risk for you because an insider can very easily pop off all the keys for the laptops and sell them or get access to them. But Microsoft know that this is a problem and they don't want to be bugged all the time by people who can't boot up their laptop. So in a corporate environment, your keys are stored, uh, your private key, 
uh, the key that protects your disk is actually stored on the domain uh, server. If you don't trust Microsoft or any corp company, you, you do know that Microsoft encryption was... Did anybody read about the problem that, uh, that, en that encrypted drives had recently? So it wasn't happening. So the, the software, uh, the, the hardware encryption wasn't working. <laughs> so there's a hardware encryption that you can have on your laptop it's faster than software encryption. And somebody found for, I think it was a Samsung, uh, Samsung uh, drives, SSDs. I think it was SSDs. Uh, please help me here if I'm getting all this wrong. I'm fairly sure it was a Samsung SSD wasn't actually encrypting. Unbelievably, you thought that BitLocker was encrypting onto the SSD and it wasn't. So actually, if you were using software encryption, it was working perfectly. But few people go for software encryption. They go for hardware encryption with BitLocker. So it's been shown that there was a flaw in the hardware encryption, and it wasn't actually encrypting. And somebody went along and looked at the SSD and the data on the disk and could actually reveal that it was not encrypted so I advise you to go for software encryption. <coughs> It'll slug your computer, but these days you've got GPUs and so on, so it's not a, a problem really. If you don't trust closed source systems such as Microsoft BitLocker, then TrueCrypt is the, is the best open source uh, software around. It will run on Linux, when I used to get exam papers from another university, they used TrueCrypt. I sent them my public key, and this was fantastic. I loved this. They didn't send me the exam papers in the post or as Word documents with a password. Who, what crazy person in the world thinks that putting a password on a Word document is any security at all? I don't know if you've ever went in and modified your docx and stuff like that. It's rubbish PDFs too. So this university would send me the TrueCrypt volume. I would then apply my private key and I mounted it as a disk onto my machine and I could look at the exam papers. And it was trusted both the sender and the recipient. So TrueCrypt is open source and will run quite happily on Windows or Linux. And you can create small drives. You can put it onto a thumb drive. You can send it over email and then people will remount it as a disk drive and only, you can only do it if you're using, uh, if you have the right keys to actually do it. So it's installed in Linux Kali but not in your Ubuntu. So this is the only part that we want you to run in your Kali machine. We could have installed it on Ubuntu but didn't uh, up to now. So use your Kali here and then what we'll do is we'll, we'll uh, uh, use that and then I'm going to give you some some drives uh, that are encrypted and then you're going to try some passwords and see if you can decrypt them. There's a program called TrueCrypt just like uh, Hashcat we can give it a library of words so the fundamental weakness of full disk encryption is that you haven't used the full key space you've actually used the password to generate the key. So if you've used QWERTY as your password for your hard disk, you're kind of stuffed. <laughs> uh, so TrueCrypt is a way that you can actually uh, run through a whole lot of passwords and then see if you can get your, uh, the encrypted drive to, to, to open. Okay, so that's, that's the lab that we'll do uh, today. Does anybody have any any questions on on what we've on what we've done, uh, what we've looked at at all? Uh, I appreciate it. Maybe all new to you. It maybe you prob maybe know this all already. I really can't highlight enough the importance of understanding what keys you're actually uh, uh, using.
Okay, so, so let's, let's go for our little quiz again this week and let's see if someone else can win the t-shirt. The wrong one. Try and find where I am, and there we go. Good. That's not a good start, is it? Just let me let me get my Wi-Fi working, and then hopefully you'll be able to connect in a little minute. Sorry. There we go. 45, 29, 14. Good. Okay, we've got 16. 16. Got at least 30, I think. So we'll see if we get 30. Sorry about that. Oh. Okay, you're all connected. You're connected. Good. Right then. So what's that first one? I didn't go over it, but what's a typical key size for RSA? I did kind of mention it. I'll show you some key sizes. When we look at digital certificates, I'll show you roughly what the market is. Oh, quite a good spread there. 2K, 2K, not 128 bits. <laughs> not 256 bits, no way, Jose. Uh, 512 is crackable. 512 don't even go anywhere near. So there is 14 people that just need to have a little think <laughs> about the security a little bit. Uh, uh, 1024, that's where it used to be, uh, but industry has now moved away. You'll not find any certificate online that is still 1K uh, from there. Sorry about that. And 2K is where we are. And uh, where is it? Is it? Sorry. There we go. I need to move around a bit more. Uh, 4K was a good answer. And maybe sometime soon uh, it'll be 4K. So that was uh, good. So we'll see who who got that one right. Oh, we've got uh, Bobby Big Booty, is that this? <laughs> we've got Macadio, Clive, and Breeze. We've got a whole lot of new names there. there. Oh, it says, it says question six. Have I, have I jumped too far here? Did I start at question five? Is that is that where I went wrong? <laughs> start question three. So hopefully, I don't know why it jumped there. Right. Okay. So that's us back at the start. And there. Okay, so that that's us that's us connecting again. So hopefully, hopefully it all <coughs> connected back. Okay, is that us all back in? Is that a different code or is that just the same one? Okay, good. Yeah. 
think I've mucked up with this one. It doesn't look as if it's coming right here. Uh, I don't know what's went wrong. <laughs> Is it coming up with a question? Does it have a question there at all? You're in first place? That's really good, isn't it? Uh, let, 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 let me try again. I tell you what, this is how much I trust, uh, I trust Wi-Fi. Let's set up a hotspot here. <laughs> and I'll use, my, I'll use my 5G. Should connect in a little minute. Good. This is a disaster. Sorry. Uh, right. Let's 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 see if we can find uh, where you are. Okay, so that's where we were. That's that's fine. So let's see if we can go forward from there. It's going to work this time with my phone this time. Good. Okay, there you go. See, see. Don't trust Wi-Fi. Right. Start question one. <laughs> uh, what's the main threat to public key encryption methods? Uh, GPU crackers or internet connections kind of going about supercomputers, basic flaws in the methods, lack of standards, quantum computers. 13 of you were listening. Good, excellent. The other ones, you're on last week's lecture. Okay, that looks a bit different this time. I don't know why that's that's kind of different. So the Punisher is top this this week. Good. So we'll start at the second one. RSA is based on what hard problem? Factorization into prime numbers, discrete logarithms, elliptic curve, or exclusive OR methods. Good. Nobody said exclusive OR, so that must be getting better. Uh, quite a few said discrete logs and elliptic curve. You need to listen a bit more clearly to what I say. <laughs> RSA is a factorization of prime numbers. I did talk about it for quite a long time. So re read back what, what's the lecture and things like that. So it was the factorization of, uh, of prime numbers. So we'll see how, who did well there. And it looks like Ryan, Clementator, did well. Santa Claus is in there. Well, Clementator is, uh, yeah, yeah, I thought you. Well done. And Jimmy, Jimmy again. Jimmy. And Will B, Will B. But my money's on Will B. That sounds good. Right then, so I think we might come back to question five again sometime. Yeah, I appreciate this isn't. This isn't wasn't covered today, but who created the Diffie Hellman method? Diffie Whitfield, Ron Hellman, Whitfield Diffie, Addy Diffie, or Hellman Revest, Whitfield Diffie. Okay, uh, let's see who did well that time. Sad Larry, Sad Larry did well that time. But uh, DPA, DPA, who's DPA? Good, well done. Dark Horse, third place this time. You did so well in that one. How did you know that one? It's a guess. <laughs> okay, still Clementator and uh, Sad Larry is coming up on the, on the 
the rails there. So for the next one, this might be the question did before, which <laughs> so hope which is not a public key encryption method. Which is not a public key encryption method. Please get this right. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I never had a lecture. <laughs> uh, RSA is a public key encryption method. Elliptic curve is a public key encryption method. El Gamo is a public key encryption method. AES is a symmetric key. Yeah. Okay, good. Right then, so next one. Let's give the next one a try. Oh, so this one you've already done, so that's good. I don't have to do that one again. Okay, so you're going to get double points here. Double points. Clive did well there. DP didn't do so well. And, uh, ooh, who's, who's Mickey Udo? Mickey Udo? Mickey Udo? Mickey Udo? No? It's you. Yeah, good. <laughs> Nothing to be embarrassed about. To be in the lead. It's good. Okay. Uh, Hashberg. He's always in there somewhere in the top 10, but never quite getting to that top spot. So we'll see how we get on here. So question number six. For public key encryption, which public key encryption method does Bitcoin and the Tor network use? I did say it. It's RSA, elliptic curve, El Gamo, or AES. It's definitely not RSA, and it's definitely not El Gamo. It's an elliptic curve. That's the method that we use for both Tor and Bitcoin and all IoT and lots of other things. So lots of people got that one right, and lots of points there. And it's still Mikundu in there. So the next one. Question seven, Bob wants to send Alice some bitcoins. Which key does he use to allow the transaction? His private key, his public key, Alice's private key, <laughs> or Alice's public key? Oh my God. We'll go into more detail when we go into blockchain. His private key. His private key is fundamental to that. He posts it, yeah, so everybody agrees to it, but it's not going to happen apart from that. Did you get that one? Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's a bit across the board. When we do blockchain and Bitcoin, you'll all know that answer, so don't worry. Okay, but if you own cryptocurrency, then be a bit worried, <laughs> honestly, because it's a bit of... A <laughs> yeah, be worried. Uh, so if you... If the, oh, the guy, those guy died. I died. Uh, and his password, he's sitting on millions of cryptocurrency. It's all a bit kind of strange. Uh, his death certificate, I think, looks a bit strange. So I wouldn't like to say <laughs> maybe what happened, but all that cryptocurrency of people's cryptocurrency has disappeared. So don't let anybody hold your, your private key for you. Uh, do you know the best way to store your cryptocurrency key, your your wallet? Paper. 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 In a safe. In a safe. <laughs> and burn your mobile phone uh, at the bottom of the sea. That's a good one. In Iceland or some of the bottom, a volcano or something like that. Uh, a bit of paper and print out the 12 words or 13 words that it gives you. Those 13 words recovers your 256-bit encryption key. You put frog, mountain, Edinburgh, yeah. and it recreates the key exactly as, as it was. Okay, so, so we'll see who, who can be trusted with uh, their Bitcoins. Those that can be trusted with Bitcoins are these people. Uh, DPA didn't do so well that time. You got cryptocurrency? Good. I'm glad. <laughs> <coughs> Still the same. <coughs> Still the same in there. Spartan Green is a new one from there. But does, uh, I think, 
I think it's quite, it's quite it's quite close. We'll see how we get on with this one. Bob has sent Alice some bitcoins. Which key does Alice use to prove that she has had the bitcoins transferred? Uh, Bob's private key, Bob's public key, Alice's private key, or Alice's public key. She's in the money. So what key does she use to prove that she's in the money? Bob's public key. She doesn't use any key at all. She proves that Bob signed it with, with Bob's public key. Oh, that's good. Uh, uh, think that one through. Okay, think that one through. <laughs> Hello, Bob. Can I have your private key? Yeah, no problem. Yeah, that's, that's okay. Yeah, no problem. I'll just send it through right now. Okay, <laughs> think that one through. Okay, basically, you wouldn't believe the number of times we've had interviews here and we've said to people, like, what were you doing? Say, oh, yeah, I'll send you my private key. Are you sure? Oh, yeah, I think that's what the professor said. But are you sure you want to send me <laughs> your private key? Oh, yeah, that's fine. Is that right? Well, I don't know. <laughs> you tell me, if you want to send me your private key, that's your problem. <laughs> uh, so uh, it'll become more apparent when we look at uh, Bitcoin and blockchain and so on uh, for, for that. Oh, there's a bit of a change here. Ryan did well there. Trust him with my cryptocurrency. Who's that? Yeah. Ryan, it's still... Still in, still in the lead, yeah. <laughs> and the questions keep coming. <laughs> I think this might be the last one, so so you can. Uh, I want Sad Larry to win. I want Sad Larry. Who's Sad Larry? You're not going to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> you regret that name now, don't you? Uh, Spartan Green. Who's Spartan? Let me see who it could be. But you're pink. <laughs> you're Cerise. You should be S Spartan. Cities something next week you can do that. Will be Ryan Jobert, DPA is kind of your kind of always in the middle, aren't you? These ones, Liam, 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 and Clementator is uh, there, and Clive uh, there, and there. <laughs> Tell me what it says. It's is is just made up, is it? Okay, yeah. Good. I think this might be the last question, so this is your last chance to get the T-shirt. Uh, Bob uses a G value of two and an X value of three, and we have a prime number of five. Oh my God! What's the value of G to the power of X mod P? <laughs> Don't you just love that on a Friday afternoon when you get something like that that just pops your brain? If somebody gets this, you deserve the T-shirt. I can assure you. So. I'm shocked. Was that a guess? Because it was in the middle. No? Honestly? Honestly, come on, you can tell me. Was that a guess? It was a guess. No. Did anybody calculate that in their heads? That's, that's astonishing. Okay, at least nobody got zero or five. You were a normal distribution, so, so that, that's fine. <laughs> the answer is C. Uh, so that, uh, we'll see how you got on there. Okay, so we'll see the geniuses coming through here. Oh, Jamie. Um, I kind of didn't know it didn't do so well there. Oh, oh, Clive. So who was Clive? Who was Clive again? Who was Clive? Clive over there? Well done. Oh, and there's another question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> for, for goodness sake. If I hadn't melted your brain enough, this one's going to get even more difficult. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he, he, here we go. Uh, you do know it's an open book test and all that kind of thing, and I'll be giving you, uh, I'll be giving you a study guide and stuff like that. You do know that, yeah. This is a bit of fun, <laughs> okay? <laughs> or maybe not. But uh, okay, we'll try. We'll try question ten. And uh, we'll see how we get on with this one. I can't remember. This, this maybe treads into another area. Roughly how many bits are in an elliptic curve public key? 128, 256, with I will go over this again when we get to Bitcoin. And you'll see, I did talk about it. Whoa. 
512. Does anybody know this? Oh. Uh, no? Can I crack a ball? Kind of. Remember, it's two, two values that you have. <coughs> oh, Hashberg. Spartan Green, Sadlari Bone, and Jabbar. Oh, it's still another question. Oh my God, it's never going to end. <laughs> never. You want me to finish there? Do you want me to? Is it? This is the last one. Okay. Do you want to go for the last one? Yeah. We can't stop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's because you're not winning. <laughs> the person who was winning went like that. <laughs> So uh, there's a majority in favour of going for question 11. And if I haven't melted your brain enough, then you're going to get your brain melted maybe in the lab. So here we go. We'll try question 11. It's an uh, it's open book test, and I'll be given study guides and stuff like that. And so in RS, in RS say if we generate N, which P times Q, if N is 91, what are P and Q? Oh, my God. 9 and 13, 7 and 13, 3 and 31 or there's no prime numbers in there at all. Oh, seven and 13, well done. No prime numbers, uh-oh. Okay, so we'll see who's the winner then. See who's fastest there, Jamie, Wartooth did well there, Clive. Oh, Clive, Clive. Oh, yeah, Clive wins, yeah, well done. <laughs> Have you already got a t-shirt? Have you got a t-shirt already? Have, do you have a t-shirt already? Uh, no. This is your first time? Well done, good for you. Okay, we want everybody to have a t-shirt, okay? And you will have a t-shirt by the end, okay? So I must say again, it's an open book assessment for our, our, our exam. You'll be given study questions that you can study against, you can ask questions. I'll get you well prepped for uh, the, the presentations. Okay, well, thanks. Thanks very much. Hopefully you've learned a little bit more <laughs> than you learned. I can only say, watch those SSH keys. Now that's <laughs> you, you'll thank me for that one day. Watch those SSH keys. <laughs> <laughs>